So before I start, everyone should see a PowerPoint style slide. Is this the case? Perfect. Yep. All right. So today in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the types of web maps which exist in the JavaScript world in 2021. I'm going to break this into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the core concepts, not all the core concepts. We don't have enough time for that, but just enough so that you get the common lingo so that I can actually get to the good stuff. Then for the second part, I get to the good stuff. I show you some examples of five to six of the major map, and then I talk about the number six. And I'm gonna show you these web maps that you're most likely to use in the JavaScript world. Well, speaking uh, to what I perceive as their strengths and the weaknesses alone. Then finally, in the third part, I'm gonna sum up, I'm gonna compare them. And the plan here is that I want you to gain an appreciation that these there's no one map that rules them all. But rather, this is just a, uh, a cabinet of tools that you may use for the appropriate situation. That's really it. And I also want to give an appreciation that this is also a fast moving target, just like everything else in the software development world of the web. The ecosystem of 2014 or 16 or 18 is much different than the ecosystem of 2021. So even if you haven't really, if you've been up to date a few years back, you'll get at least some value to understand where the ecosystem sits today. If you need to map something, knowing which library to use at the start based off your strengths and weaknesses and the plans and the projects and your understanding of what map and library does what best is going to help you save time and ultimately the money of the people that you work for. However, again, I'm not going to be talking about all the things. Geospatial is a vast topic. It incorporates all of the wares. And because of that, there are a lot of things I can't include in this 30 minute block. I'm not going to talk about data formats or sidecar files, even though I spent a lot of time in my day to day thinking about that. I'm not going to talk about the core basics such as types and topology. Um, I can, but again, that's another topic for another day. And I don't think that particular thing is relevant for you all right now today. I'm not going to talk about storage or conversion. Storage and conversion is the most difficult problem facing geospatial data processes uh, and knowing what to do. Geospatial is messy, but that's definitely something you can approach myself or my colleagues about. Here today, we're going to talk about the display layer and the display layer only. So you've already got the introduction. I'm Brian. I work for Spark Geo. At Spark Geo, we provide geospatial expertise to tech companies. You can reach me at brianbancroft at sparkgeo.com. I love these guys. Um, you can also reach me on the Toronto JS Slack. And if you can't reach me at uh, my Spark Geo email, you can also reach our company. There are a lot of smart, talented individuals in the web and the cloud who know how to bring expertise that relate to geospatial stuff to any other tech sector. So if you've got questions, please ping us. Also, because it's a Zoom call, it's easy to talk over each other. So if you've got questions, feel free to raise your hand. Also, I'll try to pay attention to the chat or I'll at least ask someone to bring up questions that are brought up in the chat if I can't figure out how to see it. But um, I love questions. Questions are the way that I know that you're interested. And when you ask questions, you also engage me. It's a virtuous circle, I promise you that much. So we're gonna get started. Let's talk about some core concepts. I'm gonna cover just enough for you to understand most of the lingo that I plan to throw at you later on. And as part of it, I'm gonna give us some uh, working definitions, things like slippy maps and how they differ from static maps, reference maps and how they differ, uh, differ from thematic maps. We're gonna even poke uh, underneath the hood of a slippy map just to show you how it really works so that uh, that can also be demystified. Let's start. So I'm sure most people here are aware of static maps. They're maps that you can't pan or zoom. Uh, you can't go to the left or the right. They just sit there on a piece of paper or on a screen. They're a photograph, they're an image. And they're usually meant for one zoom level at one area. And they're also, how do I put it? They're full of compromises. You're trying to throw in a lot of information for as many people as possible based on the topics you're presenting, based on the audience that you have. So there's no perfect way to do a static map, um, but they're there and we've known them for a long time. And some people are really, really good at making them. 
they differ from slippy maps. Slippy maps are maps that you can change. You can drag them left, right, up or down. You can interact with them. You can click on them. They also aren't, another way to describe sticky uh, slippy maps is that they're not just a map, but they're a series of static maps encompassing an entire area. So in this one here, you have a map that is at one zoom level and then a different map for a different zoom level, then a different map for a different zoom level and so forth. And because of that, you can your compromises become less painful and more easy, and you can focus on making it shine and look beautiful. Slippy maps are made of tiles. There's two types of tiles out there. There's the classic image tile. These are image formatted formats that are stored in a fashion that any slippy map library can formatically access based off of a Z, based off of an X and based off of a Y relative to a certain point of truth. In fact, you can look at it right now. If we go back at this thing and open up our network tab um, with this lovely little map that I will explain a little bit in a bit. We look at our network tab and we zoom in. You'll notice that we have these things which are called tiles. And the tile really is just a tile, an image tile. And it's requested at a certain Z level, nine, at a certain X, 256, and a certain Y, a 169. That's really it. And what it does is that it assembles itself, as you see here, as the base layer. The other type of tile is something called a vector tile. And it came around last decade, mid uh, 2010s. Um, and what it is, is that instead of sending imagery or having imagery that's pre-processed and rendered on some backend or storage, what you have is something that sends the raw data in coded in protoboth and sent to the front end where something like WebGL turns it into some form of imagery. And what you can see here is it's the same idea. Here we have a map that uses WebGL. It's a little bit smoother. It doesn't zoom in and out in abstract step, steps, but rather in a continuous scale. And here, if you look at the headers, it still shows the same, what is it? Z, X, Y, 6, 18, 239.19. But uh, the difference is that instead of sending back imagery, it sends back protobuf encoded data. One of the characteristics about slippy maps is that they're rejected. Contrary to some belief, Earth is neither a perfect flat surface nor a perfect sphere. It's uh, in its own shape called the geoid, which then through a series of compromises is projected into certain forms. Most web maps use something called web mercator, which is a syndrical projection. So what happens is that the globe of the Earth itself, the geoid, is then projected on the interior of an, a, a cylinder and that cylinder is sliced and opened to make it look like a rectangle. Because of this, what happens is that certain things get distorted, um, and this is true of every projection. In this case, for web maps, what happens is that uh, Greenland, uh, anywhere that's close to the polar region, is projected in a way that it is distorted in size, shape, and area in comparison to, say, somewhere close to the equator. And this is a trade-off that a lot of people accept only because a lot of these maps are used to get you directions from point A to point B, rather than comparing the size of Greenland to the United States. By the way, America is about 4.5 times larger. Moving on from there, we have two types of, two other ways of describing reference uh, or uh, maps. One type of map can be a reference map. A reference map is anything that helps you understand a, a location or a, and it refers to a location. So Google Maps on your phone is a one example of such, or a topographic map is another one, or that road map book that you don't really use and just keep in case the cell phone service goes down. Um, those are examples of reference maps, whereas uh, thematic maps are maps that allow you individuals to understand some sort of answer to a problem. You, use, you lay out information as an overlay on top of some reference in order so that you can understand some geographic question. Um, for example, one such uh, example of a reference map would be uh, overlaying, uh, 
overlaying um, plant hardiness uh, over a reference of the continental North America to understand what type of plants can grow where. There's many other types of thematic maps out there. Can anyone here in the chat box uh, give one that they're probably going to be, uh, how do I put it? They're going to see a lot of them in the next little while. Also, how do I see the chat box? There we go. COVID cases across the world, that's one. Um, there's also those election maps. Those are definitely thematic maps as well. Yes, exactly. All right, let's move on. So before I go there, does anyone have any questions? Um, I've talked a little, little bit right now about what types of maps are. We've talked a little bit about uh, the lingo. We've talked about slippy maps versus uh, static maps. We've talked about reference maps versus thematic maps. And we've talked a little bit about what the slippy maps look like underneath the hood. Do we have any questions? All right, I'm gonna move on. Let's talk about some maps. So I'm just gonna show you five of the six major maps. Uh, the sixth one I'm not going to show you because it doesn't play nicely with others. And these are all live examples right now that I have. So the first one I'm gonna show is something called Open Layers. This is a name of a library that exists in the JavaScript realm, all these are. Open Layers is probably one of the first major open sourced JavaScript web maps. It's a slippy map. It is meant mainly for PNG titles, but it does accept map box vector tiles, as well as everything weird. There's uh, no services that support open layers. It's a purely open source, uh, and it exists in concert with a whole bunch of other tools and utilities uh, that are make part of something called FOSRG, free and open source for geography. It's the main map library for the FOSRG stack. The strength behind open layers is its extensive API. If you, can, if you need something in the two-dimensional space that no other web mapping library can do, there's a great chance that open layers can do it, but its weakness is in the complexity. One of the problems with open layers in general is that it's, how do I put it? It's a open source structure, um, but it's, a, it's an object-oriented structure that has classes. It, everything is a class that somehow plugs into each other and it doesn't always make sense about how it plugs into each other unless you do extensive reading of how those things plug into each other. So what that means is that if you need to do something very simple and very fast and you don't have a strong background in geography, this probably isn't the, the, the library for yourself. But if you really need to do something that nothing else can do, there's a pretty good chance open layers can do it if you have the time. Last but not least, it lives on NPM. So all its modules live in NPM, and they work well with all the, your front-end frameworks, whether it's Savelle, Vue, Angular, or even React. The next library I'm going to talk about is Leaflet. So what we have here is a nice thematic type of map on a slippy map here. And Leaflet here is everyone's favorite beginner map library. If you need to get something fast and furious out and uh, quick, you are going to have the easiest time doing it in Leaflet. It's the first one I was able to use in confidence uh, when I started doing web mapping in general. And there's a good plugin system, even though a lot of them are a bit outdated. Some of the weaknesses or fallbacks of it is that it only uses uh, image tiles. So if you want something that uses, um, what is it, uh, vector tiles, this library will not be for you. You can use it to go, you can control what base maps you want to use. You can either uh, roll your own on uh, S3 or you can use an external service, uh, which I'd be happy to share uh, um, later on if you have those questions about what base map services exist. But you don't really have a lot of control of the base map itself, except that you can put it on and you can put stuff on it. That means that, for example, you can't have a layer United States pop above these polygons. That being said, it works very, very well with JavaScript. And it is also an NPM. And if you are using React or other libraries, you're going to have a very easy time finding well-maintained wrappers for it for your framework of choice. It's also fully open source as well. And it only uses a single Mercator, a single projection with Mercator. 
Whereas open layers, it'll use whatever you want it to, all of them, if you have the time. All right, next one is one of my personal favorites. It's Mapbox GL. This was the first one that decided you go with the WebGL vector tile approach, meaning that it was nice and smooth. It's fast. Everything loads fast. And one of the lovely part of it is that unlike leaflet or open layers, uh, because everything is a, a vector layer, it means that you can sandwich anything you want. One second, I can see a question. Ah, thank you. There's people doing the uh, links. Okay. So there's people, you can actually sandwich layers. So in this case, what you have with Mapbox GL is you have these labels. It is perfectly possible to add a, like a, a polygon that you brought in from data and squish it between or underneath the streets, but above the buildings. And so that the labels and the streets still are visible. The other thing about it is that you can control the, uh, you can control both the, uh, well, you can control the base map, both through the JavaScript, using JavaScript on the front end or through an external service that provides the data as well. So you can do things like this. And the service that Mapbox backs onto um, is actually pretty fundamentally solid. It's meant for designers. This thing, the strength of this thing is, is that it's meant for designers. So if you have to have the previous map in the world, that's a web map, this is probably the thing that you go for, especially if you're in the startup sector. Um, the actual design, Mapbox Studio, it was meant for designers. You don't have to be a programmer to understand it. The, um, also, this is not an open source library, even though it's on NTM and everything else like that. It's not open source anymore. They had to do, they had to make the gradual conversion to closed source, which is fine. Um, they, they had a lot of goodwill for the support of the open source community before then. And there is a fork of the previous version of Mapbox GL, Mapbox 1, that um, is called Map Libra. That is called Map Libra. And yes. All right. I'm going to move on to Google Maps now. Google Maps is not on NPM. It is closed source. And more importantly, it does not play well with most other maps. They, uh, if their legal finds out that you're mixing and matching their geocoders or other things with their competitors, they will let you know. You have to be very careful when using Google Maps. And also, you also have to make sure that they have your building. They, have a, they give about uh, a couple hundred dollars a month in free usage. But that being said, they do like to charge money. This is great if you happen to be an enterprise or if you're really embedded into the Google Cloud. And the other great thing about it is that it's Google. So what it means is it has by far the best proprietary data set there is. You can also customize maps the same way that you would use Mapbox, although their interface itself is not as great as Mapbox's. Um, Google's interfaces do work, but they're not as robust. Um, that's really all I can say about that as well. I would use this if I was really embedded in a Google project. For the same reasons I can talk about Bing. Bing is not one of my favorites in the world. It, uh, they're trying and they've got a lot of space to catch up on and they are trying to roll their own where everyone else has had at least a decade or a decade and a half of, head, of, um, of lead time. It is a PNG map, but they did some an image tile map. But the one thing that they changed from everything else is that the label itself, the labeling, it's all dynamic. So at the very least, you have the potential of smooshing layers in between the label layer and the content layer. So that at least if you show something that's a thematic, you can at the very, very least see where you're at. I would recommend this only if you're deeply embedded into the Azure and you don't want to go through administrative burdens. The other thing that they have that uh, no one else has is this bird's eye option where you could actually see bird's eye imagery. I haven't had a case where I personally need it that much, but it is a thing, it is there. Last but not least, it doesn't play well with others. I'm not sure if many people have ever heard of the company called Esri, and they have a major branch close to you in Toronto, just east of the Don Valley. Esri is about as ubiquitous in the geospatial world as Microsoft is to people with their first computers. 
it had a, it, for the longest time, they had a lock on desktop user interfaces that help display, style, and analyze spatial data. They still have a lock on that market, and their primary uh, business is BDG. They're there for the big governments, although they have recently tried with Amazon as well as opposed for Amazon making their own map platform. They have a solid, it, it's a decent enough map library that has improved. They went all in on the Dojo framework and they, about uh, several years ago, and it took them a while to get out of their syntax and more towards something that is Webpack friendly. But at least now with their fourth major version, they have something that you can download on NPM, which is more than you can say about something reliable for Bing or Google Maps. They also do 2D and 3D uh, mapping. Mapbox is the only one that I've mentioned that also does the 3D well. I don't have a demo on this one at the moment. So that's really all through them. Before I continue and talk about uh, comparing, I've got the chat box open. Does anyone have any specific questions about maps? Specific questions about maps in general, maps or, or any of the libraries. Um, yeah, or maps in general. Go for it. Uh, I got one. I can think Go of. Um, yeah, we had another one in there before too, but uh, I'm just gonna jump the queue as it just came to my head. Um, how common, I guess, is like the use of like um, safe softwares like FME Workbench in um, kind of ingesting like geospatial data and you know processing that and turning into something um, for other software so fme safe software is ubiquitous it is a great piece of software and it exists at a different side or a different part of the chain they're not in the display side they deal mm -hmm. with data conversion right I only asked because I, I encountered it in, um, I guess, like in dialogue with Esri. Um, and it just seemed like such a micro area, like, or um, at a company I worked at, it seemed like it was very difficult to find people who like knew that software in and out. Um, but yeah, uh, another question that we have in here right now is, has there been any projects where you needed the continents to be an accurate scale to each other? That's super interesting. Yeah, I wonder. So the answer to that is that uh, I personally have not. I have personally been focusing on areas that uh, are more abstract. Um, and a lot of you, I would uh, fathom or I would guess, because you're focused on the uh, Toronto or abstract ideas, those sort of distortions, you're probably not going to get hurt by it as someone who is trying to show a map of the world. Um, so. I haven't had to personally make those calls myself. Uh, more times than not, I've been able to just stick it on Web Mercator because people are really just interested in the uh, deep down, close up, as opposed to far away. And only at certain points does it become difficult. And in the places where it is required, where I have to have some accuracy of areas, I usually, my go-to has always been to switch to some sort of UTM, um, UTM, projection, which can be done in ArcGIS as well as open layers, but I've only had to do that with paper maps because most of the people who really need that accuracy are the people who are going in the field and going for long walks. We've got a few questions in the chat as well. Um, why yeah. don't, if you want to start knocking those out or should I read them out? Um, can you go ahead and read some of them out? So we have, um, can the 3D maps more accurately represent a geoid rather than the 2D projections that would be distorted? The, the answer is yes, they would in general, but keep in mind that when you zoom in far enough, everything gets projected to two dimensionals, uh, two dimensions. So, which means that at some point you have to make that trade off. And generally a lot of software that you see like Google Earth, um, as well as ArcGIS Online, they, with their scenes, what they do is, is at a certain uh, level, they, they, you can't really tell, but they do project it into 2D. The, um, and how difficult is it to layer on 3D versus two dimensions? 
the answer is it's not a, it's not really that difficult um, if you're using a just because these libraries are meant uh, generally for to help abstract away those particular problems so that so long as you have valid uh, geospatial data you can just lob it on like uh, like toppings on an ice cream sundae and not have to think about it to a great deal so long as you've done the math and you're not putting on like uh, habanero deaf peppers on uh, on your ice cream nets. <laughs> <laughs> Another question is, what makes a good map library choice for natural resources like gold, lumber, et cetera, versus COVID or election data? That's a very good question. I'm going to get back to get back to you on that one. And if you, I still haven't answered that question to you, feel free to ask that one again. And I think that's that. Okay. Um, yeah, Kurt, let's, uh, let's talk about that right now, because we're going to talk about how they compare. So if you're um, a lot, our lot right now as software developers is that we don't really have a lot of control over the purse strings of our bosses, depending on the company's uh, size. They decide that they're going to go all in on this. They're going to decide to go on on that. And so if they do that for a specific cloud environment, chances are you may have to live with it. But if they don't, that's when you have to start making these decisions. So, so if you're uh, talking about natural resources, so, Kurt, can you go on off mute for a second? Can you talk, Kurt? Sorry, I got my sorry, I got my mouth full. I was eating something. Oh, excellent. Um, so, for example, when you're talking about natural resources, are you talking from a uh, a reference map for project uh, project people working on a project, or are you talking about a uh, for the high level uh, business people decide that? Uh, where they want to do the next mine? Uh, basically, in my past experience, has been where the people want to do the next mine. So that's generally where most of my interest comes from, I guess you could say. So because we live in Canada, uh, and because a lot of resource extraction happens up north, you're going to be uh, making thematic maps that deal with in the north. So this is actually that case where Web Mercator may be a bad idea in general and projecting it would be. You would have to use open layers for that or Google I think has some way of doing projections although it's a lot more difficult. But at the same time, if um, I'm just thinking here, sorry. If you're using open layers, what it means is that you're making a, a straightforward simple map that allows people to zoom in and zoom out and show where the bounds of where the things are. And yeah, that um, having in that projection means that they don't accidentally assume that, hey, they have a lot more area to harvest for gold or lumber than they actually do. For COVID or election data, COVID itself, uh, what we're looking at is whatever the, the mysteries of health uh, give us. Uh, for example, uh, Ontario is a lot more forthcoming with the information that passes your way than uh, us in BC, where we're not supposed to have any. Um, so you because it's the entire province or the entire country, you're generally looking at the provinces as a whole, which means that you probably don't need to overthink it because no one's going to look at the map and say, thinking that, Oh my gosh, Nunavut is like eight times the size of PEI, or sorry, of uh, BC, and it has only three cases. They're going to see it as the territory that it is, and they're just only going to care about the uh, the rate of infection per uh, number of people. Um, election data itself, <sighs> most people do it in uh, most people do it in Web Mercator. It may be a good example of using an open layer, so, but or even D3, which I haven't talked about in this lecture, and that is a bit of an oversight, but- uh, One question, when, when you say open layers, these are like vector type maps, right? They're not like raster or anything like that? They're raster, but you can overlay geo, um, like a vector style data, like in GeoJSON format on top right. of it. Right, okay. And GeoJSON, just because it's the first time it introduced that term, GeoJSON is really just a special flavor of JSON that uh, exists in the web standards. That uh, it's JSON, but you must have these keys. And if you have these keys, you will get to be able to represent data. Cool. Um, all right. The other things uh, worth mentioning right now um, while I compare. 
The only open source libraries that exist right now were our leaflet and open layers, although Mapbox Chill was once that case, and the Map Libre fork is. Google Maps does do cartographic projections. That's not correct. Um, but they also do spheres like ArcGIS, uh, JS API. I wouldn't use, Cesium does exist. Um, but uh, if you just want to do spheres, but uh, it's, yeah. Yes, you do have to punch in a credit card for free, uh, even for a Google Maps API. That is correct. And I'm not sure what it is for Bing or Mapbox as well anymore, but I do believe Mapbox, you don't need that yet. The, uh, the big thing is, is that if you really want something fast, leaflet. If you want something that's well styled, uh, if you want something that's well styled, Mapbox GL is probably the best one you can possibly do. If you want different projections in the open source and you don't want to pay a lot of money, open layers is definitely your friend. And if you are already integrated with the enterprise systems of Google, Bing, or, or, or Azure, that is, or our Esri itself, yeah. So Kurt, I actually looked at that before I gave the talk. Kurt is wondering if AWS has something coming up or existing. So Amazon itself has made a partnership with Esri and it shows you how to make Ezra JS maps. However, I'm not, if you talk to anyone in the geospatial industry, and I'm probably not anybody, so you should talk to someone else as well, but I'm, I'm skeptical that that's a relationship that can last forever, um, especially if you've been following uh, AWS with MongoDB. At some point, I figure AWS is gonna come up with its own thing, yes. Rachel, do any of these APIs offer integrations with each other? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you can use Mapbox tiles with Leaflet. Yes. So we're not, it's also worth, worth breaking the ambiguity. A lot of these map libraries also have a service that underpins them. So in the case of Mapbox, Mapbox GL is the JavaScript web mapping, mapping library where Mapbox proper is a service. And you can actually create PNG tiles and share them out uh, that have custom base map styling for use in Leaflet, in ArcGIS, in, uh, and even in probably in open layers. Yes, in open layers as well. You can also in uh, open layers show uh, vector tiles as a base map. Um, also fun fact, originally the, uh, the main lead author of Leaflet actually went and created all the Mapbox libraries, started, started the ball rolling on those. I believe he still works there. All right, any other questions? I love the questions. So many oh. options, wow. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Uh, we've talked about Solingo, we've talked about five solid choices, six solid choices, actually three of them and the three ones that you can use and would probably be awesome using if you were integrated. Um, into their uh, cloud formats um, or their geospatial, excuse me, their cloud offering, service offerings. There we go. And then I talked a little bit and we talked about comparing. If anyone's got any questions, you can find me in the Toronto JS Slack. You can also find me, email me at brian at sparkgeo.com. You can also talk to anyone else at SparkGeo. They're a lot smarter than I am at these sort of things and they can probably talk your heads off of this. This is exactly what we do. The that's all I have. And remember, there's no good choice. You just have a series of trade-offs. That's the most important thing.